In the previous lecture, uh, we discussed about the inelastic seismic response of 2D and 3D multi-story frames. For both, uh, we can have two situations. One is a strong column weak beam, the other is a strong beam weak column. When we consider uh, the case of strong beam weak column, we generally take a shear frame model uh, so that uh, hinges can form only in the columns. In the other case, uh, when the columns are strong and beams are weak, then the hinges uh, forms in the beams. So, for both types of uh, the cases, we described how to perform the analysis. When the uh, beam is weak and the columns are strong, uh, then even for the case of three dimensional frame, the analysis uh, is not uh, complex because we do not have to take into consideration the bidirectional interaction because the hinges form in the beams and the beams undergo only one directional bending. Therefore, one can calculate easily the bending moment at uh, the end sections of the beam and check whether that moment is equal to m p or not. The same case uh, is with the 2 D frame uh, for the case when the, the hinge is forming in the beam. Only problem that is encountered in solving uh, the cases where the beam is weak and column is strong and the hinges are forming on the beams. In that case, one has to find out the rotations for finding out the bending moment in the beams. And that rotation uh, is to be calculated using the condensation relationship. Uh, there uh, we obtain a relationship between the theta and delta. After finding out the delta for an incremental time interval of delta t, uh, then we also find out the incremental rotation that takes place at the cross section. Then add this incremental rotation with the rotation at the previous time step, find out the total value of the rotation, also the total value of the uh, deflections, uh, so a deflection, uh, find out then the bending moment at the cross section. In doing so, uh, we had uh, brought in a factor called alpha 1 and alpha 2, which are uh, the ratio between the uh, beam rigidity to the column rigidity. Uh, so, when the system is in the elastic state, uh, the uh, ratio EIB by EIC uh, can be easily calculated and one can form the stiffness matrix. However, uh, when the system goes into the uh, plastic state or in other words when the plastic hinges have formed in the beams, uh, then one has to be uh, cautious in finding out the values of alpha 1 and alpha 2. The formulation that we discussed uh, was with respect to a general condition uh, that is uh, the behavior the uh, material behavior or the force deformation behavior is not uh, idealized as elastic perfectly plastic or uh, bilinear uh, model, but by a, a nonlinear hysteretic uh, system uh, in which the stiffness changes at every point. So, in that case, uh, in the beginning of the solution, uh, when the, we draw a tangent to the initial uh, uh, point in the curve and that gives uh, the initial uh, stiffness uh, or tangent stiffness of the system and then we can calculate EIB and EIC based on that and find out the values of alpha 1. But subsequently, 
uh, as we proceed with the uh, integration. Uh, then over a time of delta t, the uh, is difficult to find out the values of E i b by E i c. In that case, the way it is to be calculated was explained in the previous slide that is we bring in the concept of r and uh, this r uh, is uh, can be calculated iteratively and uh, using the value of r one can find out the values of alpha 1 and alpha 2 to be used for generating the stiffness matrix at uh, the time t plus delta t. So, with uh, that background the uh, entire scheme was illustrated with uh, the help of a very simple example that is example 6.5 where we had got uh, uh, 6 uh, rotational degrees of freedom and 3 translation degrees of freedom. These rotational degrees of freedom are condensed out. We get a stiffness matrix with respect to the degrees of freedom on delta. So, with the help of that delta, we carry out our analysis and for every incremental step, we calculate delta theta and add it to the previous value of theta to get the value of theta at the current time step. So, for this problem at 1.36 second, the values of the displacements, acceleration, velocity, rotation, velocity that is or the uh, yield rotation and the maximum permissible rotation, they are given in this table. And from that uh, one can see that they are the uh, at joint 1 and joint 2 in the beam, uh, uh, the moment is equal to the MP value that is uh, uh, here the at joint 1 and 2 here at for this beam at joint 1 and joint 2, we have the values of 50 k and p. So, these two sections are yielding. Uh, therefore, this beam does not contribute to the overall stiffness of the structure. So, therefore, we uh, said that to 0 uh, in obtaining the stiffness matrix of the system and that is how we calculated the uh, total stiffness matrix of the system which is uh, shown here and from that uh, stiffness matrix we calculated the condensed stiffness matrix which is a 3 by 3 uh, stiffness matrix. With that uh, uh, stiffness matrix k delta, uh, we now calculate uh, the incremental displacement uh, for the next increment of uh, the delta t. So, uh, this was the scheme and uh, for the calculation and therefore, we see that at every uh, instant of time t, we have to check uh, in the B members whether the uh, there is a uh, plastic moment uh, is, uh, is there at a particular cross section and if there is a plastic moment coming uh, at a particular cross section, uh, then we assume um, for the next uh, analysis a simple hinge at that particular cross section and uh, carry out our uh, solution uh, with a modified stiffness matrix KT. And uh, how to take care of uh, the uh, case when the bending moment at uh, a particular time exceeds the value of MP, uh, then how to you know rectify that, that was also discussed. The same concept will be subsequently discussed in connection with the, the pushover analysis that is the subject of our discussion today. Now, pushover analysis is uh, one of the very popular method of nonlinear analysis or rather static equivalent nonlinear analysis that is performed uh, for 
uh, earthquake uh, uh, loading. In fact, the way the response spectrum method of analysis is a very a good equivalent in static load analysis for earthquake forces. In the same fashion, the pushover analysis is a very good nonlinear uh, static analysis for the inelastic dynamic analysis for earthquake forces. The uh, pushover analysis is carried out uh, for many purposes. Uh, the chief uh, among them is uh, the uh, pushover analysis for finding out the behavior of the structure uh, at uh, the inelastic stage uh, during the earthquake. Uh, that is the inelastic analysis that we carry out for the earthquake forces uh, that inelastic dynamic analysis is replaced by a equivalent and uh, static uh, nonlinear analysis that I mentioned before. Uh, second thing uh, is that for finding out the performance criteria of the uh, structures in, in the inelastic range. Uh, that also uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, obtained with the help of a pushover analysis or equivalent static pushover analysis um, that uh, helps uh, designers to understand uh, the different uh, states, inelastic states of the system when the structure goes into the, uh, the in inelastic zone during earthquake and one can specify uh, certain criteria uh, like immediate occupancy criteria uh, or failure criteria etcetera. Uh, uh, therefore, attaching some kind of performance level of the structure in the inelastic state. Uh, this is also known as the performance based analysis and design and it is routinely carried out for most of the um, multi degree of freedom systems, especially the uh, multi story building frames in order to find out or assess the performance level of the structure in the inelastic state. The pushover analysis is incorporated in most of the standard softwares that are available these days uh, like uh, SAP 2000 or or the ANSYS or Abacus for all these uh, softwares we have pushover analysis. And these pushover analysis uh, uh, require some kind of uh, data in the beginning and uh, we will describe uh, what are the kind of data that is uh, needed for performing the pushover analysis. The uh, pushover analysis uh, provides a load deflection curve, a single load deflection curve and that single load deflection curve uh, gives us an information about the state of the system uh, after yielding, but the system is then idealized as if as a uh, single degree of freedom system. So, in an overall sense the behavior of the structure in the inelastic range is understood using the pushover analysis. So, uh, the main thing that the pushover analysis provides is a single load deflection curve from 0 loading to the ultimate failure state. Load is representative of equivalent static load taken as a mode of the structure and total loads is conveniently taken as the base shear. So, the important uh, thing over here is that the uh, loads that is acting uh, in the frame uh, that load is considered to be distributed uh, in any fashion or in, in any reasonable fashion. However, uh, one prefers 
for uh, the earthquake analysis uh, that the load should be uh, in accordance with the mode shape or in other words according to the shape of the uh, first mode the loads are distributed. Now uh, once we do that then uh, the sum of the load gives us the base shear and typically uh, the by load we mean the base shear uh, in this case. The deflection may be represented by any deflection however it can be conveniently taken as the top deflection of the structure. So the pushover analysis finally provides us a load deflection curve where load is the base shear and uh, the deflection is the top displacement of the um, uh, frame. Now the pushover analysis uh, can be force or displacement control depending upon whether we increment the force or increment the displacement. So uh, we, what we do is that either we gradually increase the displacement in the structure and uh, look into the behavior of the structure or we increment the force and then we study the behavior of the structure. For both incremental nonlinear static analysis is performed and for that what we require is the K matrix which is a transient K matrix that is uh, what that means uh, this K matrix goes on changing uh, with uh, deflection uh, but over an incremental displacement we assume that the stiffness uh, or the, uh, the transient stiffness uh, matrix that does not change. So with the help of that we perform a linear analysis within the small in, uh, incremental uh, displacement and find out the values of incremental responses. The matrix at the beginning of each increment is uh, obtained to find out the response for uh, the over that increment that is if uh, the increment is at a deflection level of delta 1 then uh, the uh, for the response at delta 1 plus delta uh, we use the stiffness matrix that is developed at a deflection stage of delta 1. However, this uh, may have to be modified in certain cases those modifications uh, we will describe little later. The displacement control pushover analysis is preferred in most of the cases uh, because the analysis can be carried out uh, up to a desired displacement level. So one can uh, stop the pushover analysis at any displacement required displacement stage and uh, saying that we are interested uh, to find out the behavior of the structure up to this displacement level. Uh, so, uh, from that point of view the displacement control uh, pushover analysis is preferred. Uh, the uh, analysis uh, can be carried out uh, uh, to any desired level and this desired level obviously depends upon as I told you the uh, displacement level or the force level that we wish to impose onto the structure as uh, the final displacement or final load. Following input uh, data are required uh, in addition to the fundamental mode shape. So as I told you uh, that the loads are distributed along the height of the building according to the mode shape of the uh, structure. However, it is not necessary that one should consider uh, the mode shape or the first mode shape of the uh, structure. One can 
assume any reasonable distribution also. The other information that is required is that one has to assume a collapse mechanism for this structure and this uh, collapse mechanism is uh, uh, somewhat uh, difficult to assess for a uh, multi-story frame structure. However, one can assume any kind of collapse mechanism in the sense that in order to uh, stop the analysis, we can say uh, that we will perform the analysis up to uh, this particular uh, state when uh, certain numbers of plastic hinges have occurred uh, into the uh, structure and that we uh, consider as the collapse state. The uh, structure may not have actually collapsed. Uh, in many cases, uh, the entire analysis is performed uh, unless uh, we find in that the there is a singularity in the matrix or in other words uh, the solution cannot be carried out further. At that stage uh, we abandon and we say the structure has collapsed and uh, this kind of uh, collapses uh, which are not again a desirable kind of collapses that may occur even uh, before the complete collapse. So, this collapse mechanism that we are defining to stop or calculation is an important thing or sometimes a premature or collapse state can uh, come into picture because of the singularity of the matrix and at that stage one has to stop and the mechanism that we get uh, we say that is the failure mechanism. Next important uh, information that is to be provided is the moment rotation relationship of yielding cross section. Now, this uh, moment rotation relationship of yielding sections that are to be obtained from the cross sectional properties of the beams and the columns including the reinforcement uh, by knowing the uh, percentage of reinforcement. Uh, in the beams and columns one can find out a moment rotation curve. Uh, once we get the moment rotation curve for the uh, cross sections then those uh, moment rotation curves uh, are provided as an input uh, for the analysis. So, the whatever be the number of cross sections that we consider where the plastic hinges are assumed to form for those cross sections we provide the moment rotation relationship. Next input uh, that is necessary is the limiting displacement and now the limiting displacement may be provided so that uh, either we cut off our analysis uh, before the complete collapse in that case we can give a limiting displacement which um, is a much a smaller displacement compared to the displacement uh, that takes place uh, at the time of complete collapse. So, in order to trace uh, the complete load deformation uh, or load displacement curve that is up to the collapse state uh, we assume some uh, kind of or displacement which is generally a large displacement and give it as an input to the structure. So, that the solution automatically stops before all the, the actual displacement that you have provided is achieved. Uh, next uh, important information that is required is the rotational capacity of plastic hinge that uh, is also very important. Uh, in many cases we say that if the rotation at a plastic hinge exceeds certain value uh, then we say that there is a rotational failure at that plastic hinge. Now, this kind of uh, failure is uh, generally achieved 
uh, many a time and uh, once we uh, say that a particular plastic hinge has uh, exceeded the value of the uh, permissible rotation, then we marked that particular cross section and say that that particular cross section has completely failed. Although the structure has not uh, collapsed completely. And we identify uh, in the process of our calculation the plastic hinges which uh, have exceeded uh, their rotational capacity and the plastic hinges which have not crossed their permissible limit. Displacement uh, control pushover analysis is carried out in the uh, following uh, steps. We uh, choose a suitable uh, displacement interval that is uh, delta delta 1 for the top uh, uh, story of the frame. Corresponding to this uh, delta delta 1, we find out the delta delta 1 at different uh, levels of the frame that is uh, the for the rth level the value of delta delta 1 r is equal to delta delta 1 multiplied by the mode shape coefficient for that particular or rth floor. So, that is how one can get uh, the values of the displacements at different floor levels uh, once we have assumed some value of incremental displacement at the top uh, story of the frame. This uh, gives a vector of displacement. The index 1 denotes that this is the first increment of uh, displacement. Once we obtain the displacement vector then uh, or incremental displacement vector then we multiply it with the stiffness matrix k. Now, this stiffness matrix in the beginning or the for the first increment is an elastic stiffness matrix k. However, as the calculation proceeds, this k becomes a transient stiffness matrix and it goes on changing depending upon the displacement uh, level or depending upon uh, the plastifications that take place uh, in the frame at different cross sections. At, at any time uh, that is say at uh, the nth increment of the load, the total base shear that can be calculated by adding up the total load or total load will be is equal to summation of the delta p. Uh, over uh, the n increments. Uh, similarly, uh, the base shear uh, can be calculated by uh, summing up the base shear for each increment of loading up to the nth increment. The deflection delta 1 n that again is equal to the uh, displacement increments that is given to the top floor up to the nth increment. So, that is how one can get delta 1 n and delta v n or v n and this uh, uh, plot of uh, v v n versus delta 1 n uh, that is uh, continuously obtained as we go on incrementing the displacement. At the end of each increment, moments are checked at all potential locations of the plastic hinge. And that part is a uh, little complicated in the sense that first uh, one has to find out the value of theta n uh, at the cross sections from the uh, condensation relationship. And as I uh, described before, uh, we first find out the delta theta at uh, all the uh, sections where the yielding may take place from the incremental displacement. Once we get uh, the incremental displacement, those incremental rotations, those incremental rotations 
are added to the previous rotation to find out uh, the current value of the rotations. Knowing the value of rotation and the story displacement, one can find out the bending moment at the desired cross sections of the structure. If it is uh, found that at any particular cross section, the moment value is equal to the MP value, then for subsequent increment, what we uh, do is that we assume an ordinary hinge uh, at that particular cross section and find out the total stiffness matrix of the structure. That is for that element, we assume a hinge, ordinary hinge at the section where the plastification has taken place. Also during the calculation, uh, we go on calculating the rotations at the hinges or rotations at the plastic hinges. Uh, so, the uh, even if we assume a ordinary hinge at the time of the analysis uh, for the cases where uh, the section has undergone on yielding and there is a plastic moment or the moment is equal to plastic moment. After the analysis is performed, we uh, find out the rotation, incremental rotation also for the ordinary hinge. Now, once we get that rotations, incremental rotation, uh, then we add this to the uh, previous uh, rotation to find the final rotation. So, uh, therefore, uh, we, we can find out the rotations at the hinges uh, or the plastic hinges and we keep a record of that in order to check whether the permissible rotation capacity is exceeded in a plastic hinge or not. If uh, we find uh, that uh, there is a, a case where the rotational capacities uh, in sufficient number of hinges have taken place, uh, then uh, it may so happen that a rotational failure may precede the actual collapse mechanism. The VV versus uh, delta 1 is traced up to the desired displacement level or the collapse state. Now, during uh, this calculation procedure, the uh, kind of uh, iterations uh, that are involved uh, that uh, let me uh, explain. Uh, first uh, iteration is that as we uh, go on on incrementing the displacements at a particular level, then say we take uh, delta 1 and from this delta 1 we uh, construct the delta delta 1 vector. Uh, with that delta delta 1 vector, we get the delta p vector. Then check for the mi that is the moment at the cross sections, the desired cross sections where the plastic hinges are likely to form and check whether uh, the moment there is uh, greater than MP or not. The moment being just equal to MP is a rare case. Therefore, in most of the cases we find uh, that uh, the moment uh, is uh, maybe greater than a value of MP. If it is less than a uh, value of MP, then of course that particular cross section is uh, still in the elastic state. Now, if uh, the uh, this is not greater than MP, that means it is uh, elastic or if it just is equal to MP, then to handle that is uh, very simple. Uh, we simply um, uh, put a ordinary hinge at that particular plastic hinge and uh, obtain a stiffness matrix and carry out uh, the solution as before. That means we go for the next increment. If uh, it is greater 
then what we do is that for those cross sections we set m i to be is equal to m p. That obviously in, uh, introduce some kind of imbalance into the overall equilibrium equation. So, uh, what we do is that we can have two you know, alternative, two options. One is that after setting those uh, values of the moment 2 is equal to m p, uh, then we calculate a revised value of the stiffness matrix. Uh, that means, uh, for those uh, cross sections where the moment has exceeded the value of m p at those cross sections we introduce a ordinary uh, hinge and calculate a revised stiffness matrix. And after that we find out an average stiffness matrix that is uh, the stiffness matrix before the increment uh, that plus uh, these uh, modified uh, or the updated uh, stiffness matrix, these we add together and uh, divide it by 2 to obtain a average stiffness. And with that average stiffness, we now calculate the delta p that is the load increment for uh, the value of delta delta 1 that is the incremental displacement uh, that we have consider. So, therefore, at the end uh, with this uh, calculation we get a, a, a different values of delta p vector and uh, after the solution that means, once we have this solution it is automatically assumed uh, that the cross sections where we have uh, set m i to be equal to m p at those, those cross sections yielding have taken place and for next uh, iteration or, or next uh, displacement increment we use uh, this value of uh, k t. So, uh, in this way uh, one can uh, perform an uh, iteration or uh, an iteration may be required whenever the bending moment is exceeding the value of m p at any particular cross section. The other uh, way is to proportion as I told you before in the plus uh, inelastic analysis uh, that is the value of the MPs uh, that is uh, obtained after the solution uh, those out of that uh, we take the value of MP which is the uh, uh, the largest one and this is done for the case when more than one sections have moments greater than uh, the value of m p. So, uh, there we take the uh, greatest value of the m p and then uh, we proportion the incremental displacement in such a way uh, that the bending moment at that particular cross section just become equal to m p. In that case uh, what will happen for that particular cross section m i will be simply is equal to m p. For other cross sections obviously the uh, values will not be equal to uh, the value of m p in most of the uh, hinges the or plastic cross sections the values uh, would be would become less than the value of m p because we have proportioned the value of delta delta i. However, uh, these uh, proportioning uh, may not always lead to all sections having a value of uh, a m uh, less than m p. However, uh, with a little bit of uh, you know expertise one can proportion the value of delta uh, delta 1 or the incremental displacement in such a way. So, that we get a plastification only at uh, only at one cross section. Uh, in that case uh, the incremental displacement uh, becomes non-uniform 
and uh, uh, but that does not affect the solution and one can continue uh, in this particular fashion uh, that is we can go for the next increment of displacement uh, with uh, a plastic hinge uh, forming at one uh, cross section only uh, at a time. Uh, this kind of uh, calculation uh, may require a uh, little more time to trace the load deflection behavior. Uh, it is better that one goes for an average uh, stiffness technique to take care of uh, this kind of situation. Uh, the problem of a frame is uh, solved here using the pushover analysis. Uh, this is the moment rotation curve uh, for a particular beam and we can see that we are specifying uh, it will not be q y and q c, it will be theta y and theta c. Theta y indicates the yield rotation and correspondingly we define a yield moment and uh, theta c is the rotational capacity or the maximum rotation that we allow at the plastic hinge. Uh, the properties of the frame is given over here. Uh, we see that uh, we are we have grouped uh, the cross sections in C1, C2 and B1, B2. C1, C2 are the two groups of columns and B1 and B2 are the two groups of the beams. So, from the ground first floor and second floor level we have one kind of cross section and then their MOI value is given and the uh, corresponding yield rotation is given and the last column shows the rotational capacity uh, for that particular cross section. Uh, second uh, group is at third, fourth, fifth and sixth um, uh, story levels. There we have a reduced uh, uh, B and D and therefore the uh, yield moment is also reduced. The rotation, permissible rotation is given that is the yield rotation is given and uh, the maximum rotation that is allowed uh, that is also provided. Uh, in the same way the B1 and B2 uh, that these two groups of the beams for that the dimensions and the other required values are given over here. Uh, one can see that uh, the, uh, the there again there is a change in cross section for uh, B1 and, and uh, B2 level. The solution uh, provides us a, a result uh, like uh, the one which is shown over here. Uh, the uh, different displacements and the corresponding base shear that are shown in the uh, tabular form over here and uh, the plastic hinges that has taken place at a different levels of displacement that has been uh, noted down. Uh, that is 1, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and so on. And when we come uh, to the last value, uh, then we see that uh, there, is, uh, there are sufficient number of sections where plastic hinges have taken place. The, if we see look into the uh, base shear, we can see that uh, base shear is increasing uh, up to 346 that is the uh, last uh, but one last but one row not last but one row uh, above uh, 2. Uh, this is the uh, value uh, which is has the maximum value of the base shear and after that the base shear drops down to 307 and, and then it slightly increases 308. The base shear versus displacement plot is shown over here and uh, this goes on increasing and this value is about 346 and then there is a drop, drop in the displacement or, or the uh, base shear. Uh, this is the uh, distribution of the lateral forces 
uh, that is considered along the height of the uh, building and uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, mode shape is assumed for the analysis. So, one can um, get a plot like this uh, from the pushover analysis and if we go up to the st uh, state of uh, collapse. Uh, the plastic hinges that were traced and shown in the table, uh, they are shown over here and one can see that uh, the 17 plastic hinges have occurred and at that stage uh, the uh, solution uh, had to be uh, stopped or the calculation had to be stopped. Uh, the reason uh, for this is that uh, the, uh, if we look at uh, this particular joint, uh, we find that uh, the plastic hinges are forming at all the four cross sections surrounding this uh, joint. As a result of that, uh, there is a rotational failure that has taken place at this particular uh, uh, joint. And uh, because of this rotational failure, uh, the stiffness matrix became ill conditioned and uh, therefore, uh, the calculation had to be stopped. However, this also corresponded to a situation uh, where there is a sudden drop of the uh, base shear and uh, uh, one can say that uh, this is almost a state of failure not necessarily that uh, one may have to stop uh, the solution or the calculation procedure uh, at such a premature stage unless we have this kind of situation. If this kind of situation does not take place, then uh, perhaps more number of plastic hinges can form into the structure and one can have a calculation. Uh, calculations may be continued further or the in incremental displacements uh, can be uh, provided and, and the solution procedure can be carried out uh, till a desired uh, collapse state or collapse mechanism is formed by way of uh, the plastic hinges uh, forming at different cross sections and uh, the, the plastic hinges thus uh, will not uh, provide a situation of premature or uh, failure like this. So, it depends upon the problem to problem one can pursue or uh, uh, continue the incremental displacement up to the state of a desired collapse mechanism or the collapse mechanism that they have assumed and uh, one can get uh, that particular collapse mechanism or achieve that collapse mechanism by way of incrementing the displacement. Uh, it may so happen that uh, one may not uh, go or may not be able to go up to that state uh, before that a, a premature collapse state uh, can occur. Now, with the help of uh, the pushover analysis, some important uh, things extracted as I told you uh, in the beginning. That is uh, first thing is that one can see uh, the different uh, states of the system after the yielding that is how the plastic hinges are forming at different cross sections and what are the nature of those plastic hinges where the plastic at the plastic hinges the rotational capacity uh, has exceeded or not uh, and the plastic hinges where uh, still some rotation can take place all those informations uh, can be uh, achieved uh, during the process of the calculation and from that one can uh, define some uh, state of the system after yielding uh, or the performance level of the structure at uh, uh, different uh, states. 
uh, that is uh, very important in so far as the performance based analysis is concerned. However, uh, one of the important thing uh, that we try to obtain in the case of uh, by doing a pushover analysis is that to find out an overall ductility uh, of the system. Uh, in that case, uh, the basic philosophy with which the pushover analysis is carried out is that we convert uh, the entire system into a single degree of freedom system uh, and uh, try to draw the load versus deflection curve. The load is uh, given by Vb and the displacement is given by delta. So, one can find out a performance point uh, like this uh, that means we, this is a load deflection curve and one can have a bispectrum uh, drawn from the response spectrum that displacement response spectrum and uh, acceleration response spectrum and from that one can uh, uh, construct a bispectrum by eliminating the time uh, period scale and that bispectrum can be obtained with an assumed value of uh, the increased damping and a tentative equivalent stiffness for the entire system considered as a single degree freedom system that is when it is vibrating only in a fast mode, fast mode. Now, with that one can get a performance point, but this performance point can be updated uh, by successive iterations that is once we get a particular performance point, then one can find out a revised value of the equivalent stiffness and the equivalent damping can be obtained uh, from the, uh, the uh, loop hysteresis loop uh, giving this value of maximum value of displacement and uh, get a revised value of in, uh, in, uh, equivalent stiffness and uh, damping and find out another bispectrum curve. So, uh, that way uh, we can uh, go on doing this particular iteration till we find and that the performance point that is achieved in two successive iterations are the same. And from there one can obtain the value of the ductility required uh, ductility that is the maximum displacement that we obtain divided by the elastic displacement that is uh, when the structure first gets into the, uh, in, into the inelastic state or the first plastic hinge is formed. Uh, that is taken as the yield displacement and uh, delta becomes the uh, final displacement ratio between the two gives a overall ductility for this system. Mm -hmm.